Well, thank you so much. And uh, I say every week, or well, about every week, we are so blessed with the, the talent that God has blessed us with in our church. And uh, thank you so very, very much for blessing us this morning. You will take your Bible and turn to the last book, to the last chapter, the book of Revelation, please. We're going to be looking at just one verse this morning. And I thought it would be a great way to start the new year so that we can have our emphasis where it needs to be. You know, the, the focus of everything we do needs to be on the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? And everything that flows from here to our our children, our youth, adults, everything needs to start with the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to make Him center of everything that we do. Revelation chapter number 22, and we're going to read verse 17. And I'm going to ask you if you will please to stand for the reading of God's word. And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is athirst come. And whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. Father, would you speak to us this morning? Father, would you encourage us through your word? Father, thank you for what you'll do today. In Jesus' name we pray and for his sake. Amen. When we look at the world's condition, some people wonder where is God? Is he still on the throne? Is he still able to do the miraculous? Sometimes we look at our country and we wonder, how did we ever get in this mess? And are we ever going to get out of it? You know, I'm so thankful that we have got the Word of God. Because it teaches us about the last things. Some people say, well, where is God at? These promises were made many years ago. Listen to what 2 Peter has to say. I didn't have you stand or read this because I didn't have it put on the board, but listen to what the Scripture says. And saying, these are the stoppers, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep or died, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of that by the word of God, but by the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water and was in water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. In other words, the flood. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. This is what Peter said. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. That one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. In other words, God delays for a purpose, for a reason. And he says this, but his long suffering to us word. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's God's will that everyone come to repentance. Now in this last chapter of the book of Revelation, John speaking through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, 
gives one last invitation. The last invitation that you find in the Bible. Throughout the book of Revelation, Jesus Christ has been revealed. The scripture begins in Revelation 1, the apocalypse of Jesus Christ, or the revelation, which means an unveiling. The book of Revelation is about the Lord Jesus Christ as he is unveiled as he really is. When he came the first time, there were only glimpses of his glory. For example, when he was on the Mount of Transfiguration, they saw him in all of his splendor and all of his glory. But for the most part, the glory and the magnificence of who Jesus was was there. Well, the book of Revelation unveils or uncovers this man named Jesus Christ. When he came the first time, he came to a cross. When he comes back, he's coming for a crown. The first time he was crucified, the next time there's going to be a coronation. This King of Kings and this Lord of Lords, one day is coming back. And this book of Revelation teaches us how God has got everything in order. You know, that's why I can get up in the morning and if I choose to turn the TV on and listen to all the messages on the TV, which normally I don't, because about one thing that's on the news now is something that's negative. But if I was to listen to that, you know, you can get in a pretty bad mood pretty quickly, couldn't you? Because of all the negative stuff that's on TV. But isn't it good to be able to turn to this last chapter and find out how it ends? See, that, that's why I love to read the last chapter of books. <laughs> First, so you know how it ends. You know, sometimes things end good and sometimes things end bad. The Bible says that Jesus can come at any time. Which means this, that his coming is imminent. It could happen at any time, but that is the first stage of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. I read about a man who had uh, somehow gone in his house and he left the keys to his automobile in the switch. Now, none of us have ever done that, have we? Anyway, he got up the next morning and the automobile was gone. Stolen. And he was in the past, so he called the, the law enforcement. They came and took all the reports. Well, the next morning, his car showed up right in front of his house. It had been washed, it had been detailed, full of gas. There was a note in there that said, I am so sorry, I had an emergency, and I noticed there were some keys in the ignition. So I borrowed your car, and please forgive me, your car has been detailed, it's been washed, waxed, everything, uh, full tank of gas, and by the way, there's also two tickets to watch the Dallas Cowboys. And the man thought, man, never had an experience like that before. So he, him and his wife, they, they go to the ball game that night, and they come back. And you know what they find? The house has been ransacked. <laughs> they weren't quite as smart as they thought they were. <coughs> See, the Bible says that the, Jesus, when he comes at the rapture, and the rapture is for the church, but that's for us. It's not for the whole world. It's, it's, the Bible says he's coming like a thief in the night. We don't know when he's coming, but he's coming. And that should give us great 
joy knowing that he was coming. I was reading uh, this morning in, in uh, Revelation chapter 11, and I was sharing this with a Sunday school class, and it, it says this, and I'm going to get to the message here in just a minute. It, it says this, that uh, the kingdoms of the world are becoming the kingdoms of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And he's going to reign forever and forever and forever. Isn't that great news? I mean, to know that what we live in is not forever. We've got mansions one day. He said, it's going to be better than what we saw that night, didn't we? We went double back the other night. I said, you know what? Well, this is good. But God's got something back. Amen. Okay, it's time to get the message. All right. <laughs> it's invitation that God gives to us. The, the book of, of Revelation is God's unfolding <coughs> beginning in, in chapter 5 when, when uh, they begin to loose the seals. There's seven seals. There's seven trumpets, there's seven bowls, and what it does, it tells about how God, through the Lord Jesus Christ, is going to redeem this earth. And this Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, is coming back. He is coming back in all of His splendor, in all of His glory, at the second coming, he is coming with the church. That's us. That's who the ones who are saved. When he comes, the Bible says, when he comes in the clouds, all the world will, will see him. And they will look upon him whom they have pierced. But here the scripture says, this last invitation, after all these things have taken place, after Satan has been judged, how our Satan has been cast to the bottomless pit and that the saints of God are ruling and they're reigning. He says, there's one invitation. And this invitation is to those who have not been saved. This is what he says. He says, the spirit and the bride say come. The first invitation is from the very Spirit of God. If you would look through this book of Revelation, what you would find is that the Spirit of God is working in the lives of people. Israel has rejected Almighty God. They have rejected Jesus. That's why when, when Jesus went and he looked over Jerusalem, he wept because he realized that the nation of Israel had rejected him. But the Bible says in Romans that, that, God, that God's not through with the nation of Israel. And the nation of Israel is going through the tribulation so that their eyes can be opened, so that they can see the Messiah whom they have rejected. And so the Spirit of God uses these things to open their eyes like the Spirit of God does even right now. See, the Bible says that when he has come, speaking of the Spirit, he will convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. He is coming because, and he is here now because he lives within us as a child of God. The Bible says that when a person is saved, the Holy Spirit of God comes to live in them and uh, God works through them. So the Holy Spirit is present in us. Now, and so the, the Spirit of God was given, first of all, to convict lost people to come to Jesus Christ. No one has ever been saved except the Spirit of God brought conviction upon their life. Now you think about that. Go back to the place where you became a child of God. Here's what happened now. It, it wasn't exactly the same, but with everybody. But some things are exactly the same. The first thing is this. God began to convict you that you were lost. You might have been just going happily through the day and all of a sudden the Spirit of God spoke to your heart and you realized that you were lost. 
You realize that you were a sinner. You realize that you couldn't pay your way to heaven. Or you couldn't work your way to heaven. There was nothing you could do except fall upon the grace of God and ask His forgiveness. See, that's what the Spirit of God does. The Bible says that the Spirit of God exalts the Lord Jesus Christ. It lifts Him up. So that people can see Jesus. And that is what the scripture says. This first invitation is from the very spirit of God. Throughout the, the uh, book of Revelation, God is revealed. Jesus is revealed. The, the Trinity is revealed in this book of Revelation. But here the scripture says the first invitation is from the Spirit. Why? Because the Spirit understands who we are. The Spirit of God understands where we are spiritually. And what does He do? He draws us to Himself. But then there's also another invitation. Did you see what it said? The Spirit and who? The bride. The bride is us. We're the bride. We are longing for the bridegroom. I'll tell you, if you are saved, you ought to be looking for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. If not, you better get ready. He's coming. That's what he said. The scoffer said, where is he at? Why is he out? Why is he come? Listen. Did he come the first time? He did. Did he say he was coming the second time? He's coming. And he will come. And he will rule the world. Hallelujah. Thank God. But the, the scripture says the bride issues an invitation. Some of you get these this morning? Usher, did you hand these out like I asked you to? It's just a little card. It's a little card about the church. Give it to somebody say, love to have you come to church. Be with us. Just something very simple. But what is, what's the bride? Yeah. The bride is a church who's talked about the bridegroom, talks about Jesus, talks about who he is. I was, was thinking last night how, how God has, I've been so blessed to be able to, to share the gospel with some people, and I was, I was thinking last night, I remember a fellow a couple of churches back, and uh, his wife told me, said, and I, I believe his name was Wayne, I, I'm trying, anyway, he, she said, he's lost. And, and I really want him to be, and she was faithful all the time, and so I went by to see him a couple times, and every time I started to share the gospel, she would start answering questions. I'm going, Lord, how in the world am I ever going to talk to him when she won't keep her mouth shut? <laughs> I wasn't trying to be ugly, but it was like, and so I went one day and God said, do this. He said, ask her about her salvation. And so I, I asked her about her salvation. And she said, and she began to share with me. And as I looked at him, I said, tell me about yours. He said, I've never been saved. I said, would you like to be? He said, I sure would. And I shared the gospel with him and he was gloriously saved. And faithful until the time we left. And then I read about, I don't know if you heard this or not, but, Michael, but Judy Cox died. She played the piano in the last church we were in. Her husband, I remember going to her house and speaking with her and because she wanted, she had come to our church to visit. And her husband's name was Wallace. And I said something to him, and 
I can't remember the exact answer he gave me, but it was so bad that the hair on the back of my neck stood up. Because a while back, their house had burned down, and I thought, you know, you keep on where you're going, this is exactly what's going to happen to you. A year or so later, he was in the hospital, and she said, will you, will you go by and see him? I should be right to So I went by, and, and I talked to him, and God allowed me to leave him the Lord. I thought, man, isn't God good? I mean, isn't God good that you have people who are rejecting the gospel? And then you pray and you watch the Spirit of God work. And He just opens up the door. Folks, that's what we're to be about. We're about our Father's business. And it's our opportunity. It's our privilege to share the gospel. Wouldn't it be terrible to, to go to heaven when you die and, and God would say to you, who did you lead to me? And you say, oh, nobody. Wouldn't it be terrible to, to say before God? I'm not trying to put a pressure or anything on. I'm just saying. Because I can tell you from experience, it's the second best thing to be and say, folks. To watch somebody come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. It's the greatest thing other than your own salvation. I was telling folks in my social so you know, I've been in the place and I've seen people say to people, people like, well, just go ahead and try and bless me. I'm thinking, well, if that don't bless you, I don't know what can. If, if you if you can't get excited about the Spirit of God bringing somebody under conviction and watching them give their life to Jesus Christ and their life change, something's wrong with you. Great place to say amen. I mean, something's wrong, folks. Because that's what Jesus is all about. The Spirit and the bride say come. And he that heareth say come. You hear the gospel. Come. That invitation is all through the Bible. When Noah was on the ark, now actually he wasn't in the ark then. Noah was told, come into the ark. By whom? God. Come. Come. In Isaiah 55 it says, come. If you're thirsty, come. Jesus said, come. All that labor in her heavy laden, come unto me. The invitation of God is for you to, to come to him. The invitation of the church is to go to the world. That's who we are. We're to go and tell what Jesus Christ has done for us. And then he says, there's another invitation. There's an invitation to those who are thirsty. Those who need the living water First church we were in. I hadn't thought about this until I just started. I was preaching on the woman at the well. The little church was packed out. And I was given the invitation. And I said, All you who are thirsty, come. And my oldest daughter, Kristen, was sitting on the back row with her babysitter. She was, what, maybe two years old? And she says, if there was daddy, I'm thirsty. <laughs> well, that was the end of the invitation there. <laughs> but listen, the invitation is to those who need God. That's the invitation. 
He said, if you're thirsty, God. And there are people today who need God. They're thirsty. We just need to share Jesus with them. Because people have the same problem they had from the time of Adam and Eve. They've got a sin problem. And the only one who can take care of that sin problem is the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus, who died on the cross so that we might have life and life everlasting. And I'm going to finish up in just a moment. And have you ever wondered who the elect are? I'm going to tell you just a minute who the elect are. And it's real simple, folks. You know, churches get in, in issues about love. Who's predestined? Who's elected? Who's this? Who's that? Let me say it for you real quick, okay? This is what it says. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. That's the elect. Whosoever will. Jesus said this. If any man come to me, I will no wise cast him out. You know what that says? It didn't say, I'm so glad it didn't just say if, if Scott would come to him, he'd be saved. Does that leave you right? No, man. But see, that whosoever will includes everybody. What if the invitation is this? Whoever wants to come can come to God. If you want to be saved, you can be. That's what whosoever will means. Isn't that wonderful? So many times we get so caught up in trying to be this and that. And the, and the Bible is just so simple that says, whosoever will, let him come. You know why? Because you've got a condition. The condition is you're thirsty. You're lost. The Bible says in Lamentation that God has placed eternity in the heart of man. There is something in man that longs for God. And the only one who can settle that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Great invitation. The Spirit and the Bride say come. The Holy Spirit, the church, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ says come. Whoever hears the gospel says, come to him. Whoever is thirsty, let him come and take of the water of life freely. That's what this book is all about, folks. From Genesis to Revelation, and it's not Revelations, it's Revelation. The revelation, the apocalypse of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the one who is coming. The one who is coming to reign forever and forever and forever. The one who is coming when every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. That's the kind of God I want to serve. That's the kind of God that we need. One that is not here today and gone tomorrow, but we serve a sovereign God who has everything in his plan, everything in the, the palm of his hand. That, that's why he can issue this invitation to everyone. To come. It doesn't matter who you are. 
It doesn't matter what you look like. Doesn't matter how tall you are or wide you are or anything else. He just says if, if you're first, you can come. If you need me, you can come. If you need Jesus, you can come. Whatever the situation, you can come. Well, Lord, you don't know how bad I, I've been. Oh, yes, he does. If he knows everything about everything, don't you think he knows everything about you? Absolutely. He knows everything, past, present, future. And the Bible says he loved us. For God so loved the world. He gave his only begotten Son. That whosoever believes in him. See, there's that whosoever again. Whosoever believes should not perish. God doesn't want anyone to die in hell. He wants everyone to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. In just a moment, that invitation is I'm going to ask you this morning. You know, the Bible says He can come in time. If He came right now, would you be ready? Because here's the thing, folks. If you've heard the gospel and you've heard it this morning and you've not been saved, the Bible says when he comes, you know what's going to happen? There's going to be strong delusion that's going to come and you're going to believe a lie. That's what the Bible says. Have you been saved? Do you know that you know that you know that if you die right now, you go to heaven? The greatest thing you can have is peace with God. Knowing that if you take your last breath, the next one's going to be in eternity. Isn't that awesome to know that? And the Bible says we can know it without a shadow of a doubt. These things have I written that you may know that you have eternal life. How? By believing, by trusting, in the Lord Jesus Christ. Not some historical figure, but a relationship with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Surrendering my life to Him. I surrender all. That's the only thing God really wants from us. We can't bring anything else. We, we can't buy our salvation. Can't work for it. What do we do? We surrender ourselves to Him. Lord, just take me like I am. That's what He wants. You know, you can't go to school and learn how to get to God. He just wants you to come just like you are. And He will accept you just like you are today. That's who God is. The greatest invitation in the world. The last invitation. He says, come. Come to me. I love you. I gave myself for you that you might have life and life everlasting. The invitation is very simple this morning. If you haven't trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I invite you to come this morning. Or maybe you're here this morning and you don't have, you don't have that peace. Let me ask you to come and just pray. God give you the peace. Because it the best thing you have in the world is to know that when you die, you're going to have him. And so, uh, that's the very, very simple invitation this morning to do that. I'm going to ask you if you will, please, to stand. I'm going to pray and then we'll have our invitation in. Father, I thank you today that, Lord, you know every one of us. That, Lord, there's nothing that we will do, we have done, we're even doing right now that you're not aware of. And Lord, you still love us. You gave your son that we might have life and life everlasting. Father, 
If there are those this morning who've never trusted you, Father, I pray that the Holy Spirit of God would draw into your son. And Father, there might be no others here this morning. And that perhaps they've been in church all their lives. And they've heard the gospel over and over and over, but Lord, somehow, some way, they just don't have a peace about where they spend eternity. God, would you speak to that heart this morning? So that they might have the assurance of eternal life that your word speaks about. Father, thank you for what you're doing. In Jesus' name we pray.